Okay, I guess uh, it's time. So, hi everyone, I'm uh, Chris, uh, Blue CMD on the internet, and uh, I'm here to talk about uh, greenfield project BMCs and why we uh, why we should do them and what value they can add. So first, uh, okay, that didn't work. Let's see. How do I? No, I can't select the next slide. Should I maybe do? Okay, there we go. It's okay. Yeah, sorry. Is it better? Or... Yeah. Okay. Well, so you're gonna hear some pretty, uh, some pretty pie in the sky things. So I, I feel I should start off by saying this is like, this is just crazy talk for me. So uh, yeah. There are. So what is a greenfield product, right? So greenfield product refers to the fact that we have. Instead of having an existing building, we build or we renovate or something like that. We start on, on this beautiful green land where there is nothing and we don't have any prior work or uh, there is no constraints that uh, are imposed. So more or less, this is you take the technical legacy you have and then you just ignore it. Uh, you don't consider things like migration plans or other things. You just look at an idea and then. Um, think wouldn't it be great if this worked so yeah it's it's um it allows you to look at a, an idea and consider it for its best merit not things uh, oh what would a customer uh, say if they had to use it more like how could it actually work so um yeah you don't have any repercussions it might be faster to prototype depending on how the framework is uh you Maybe there is a very uh, strict process you have to follow in order to to get something in in some existing product. Uh, so this this might be faster to prototype using a greenfield. Um, it uh, it might serve as a way to validate something that other folks thinks is just crazy. Uh, and uh, yeah, you, you might get some data that proves that this is actually useful. So for BMCs. Um, Oh yeah, I should mention also there is there is one product that is is doing some uh, quite uh, nice greenfield work uh, that we have heard of uh, already, which is Linux boot. They they for example they are looking at uh, you don't have to use TFTP to boot for network, right? You can use HTTPS and and, and stuff like that. And I think uh, yeah, so th there are some really interesting ideas there. So for BMC though, which we're uh, in this track looking at, what can we possibly want to change there? Well, so we have heard, for example, that maybe our trust model is not as good as it should be. Uh, we've been hearing a lot of this host uh, BMC uh, trust that has served us well in the past, but maybe not so much today. Where the provisioning story is also quite interesting, which we're going to look a bit uh, on as well. Authentication is another one where uh, I think there is a, a lot of room for improvement that we can, uh, and yeah, some some ideas I'm going to present there as well. Then I have authorization, we have metrics, we have management, and we have yes, there is quite a lot of things we can uh, look at. But sadly, we we only have 30 minutes, so we we're gonna pick three of these, and the, the, these are going to be the th uh, the th uh, three first that I mentioned. So the what. What do I mean when I say revisiting the trust model? Well, so historically, the BMC has just been an assistant to the host, right? So you, whoever owns the host, like financial or otherwise, is the owner of the BMC. So why should you ever want to protect yourself from the host? Well, today that has has changed, right? Uh, and uh, you you've seen that with the pants down uh, vulnerability where I, I am, so my, my thinking there is that that was not a surprise for a lot of people working in the BMC space because that is just how BMCs used to work. This became a CVE because our expectations from the customers has, has changed, not because something suddenly broke. Right? So this is just how the industry has evolved and we need to follow, follow with the industry. So usually, how, how do we do this? Well, we, we, we can just disconnect a lot of things from the host. That's simple as that, right? If you don't need 
like a PCI Express connection to the host, for example, for VGA or otherwise, you can just maybe buy a BMC that does not have that, or maybe disable the clock if you're already stuck with that BMC. So that can serve for uh, a lot of uh, the use cases uh, to, to, uh, to um, yeah, to isolate uh, that trust. But th there is one concept that I would like to focus on that is a bit more tricky that, uh, that I don't think has received so much attention, but is, is still quite uh, crucial. And that is, how do we acquire the wall clock time of the BMC? So today, how do we do this? Is we, we essentially, oh yeah, sorry. Uh, why should we care even uh, about time? Well, a very obvious, choice is logging, right? And, and anyone that has ever debugged something from two machines that have a clock skew or even the wrong time zone to, uh, configured knows how painful that is. So, but yeah, and then you have things like scheduling where maybe there is someone that does some kind of uh, BMC API calls every X and it's you told the BMC to do it internally and then you want to do that, I don't know. But the most important thing is authentication. So while maybe in the past this hasn't been a big problem where we've been using password authentication and such, uh, with the uh, with times you know progressing, we we are now looking into more uh, advanced forms of authentication with certificates and time based. So if uh, when you have such uh, authentication or credentials, you if you control time, you control the life cycle, right? You can jump backwards in time and then suddenly that credential that you ma managed to lift from someone is valid again. So this is quite important. Uh, yes. So how do we acquire time today? A lot of systems just blindly copy it from the host and that's the trust problem we have. Uh, so what, what can we use instead? Well, the, the first naive idea is to use M uh, MTP and that, that works for, for a lot of cases, and it's you for people not familiar with it, it's you just have public name, uh, sorry, time servers out on the internet that you can just get your time from. The problem with this is that it's not secured and it's not authenticated. So, there, if you're a bad actor and you you you're able to influence this, then you can lie. So th there are some additions to NTP where you have secure NTP, but the problem with this is that that doesn't really scale and it hasn't uh, been adopted publicly. So we need something else. There is this uh, protocol called rough time uh, and the name kind of implies that it's you get a rough time. So it's, it's um, yeah, it's, it's, it is a service meant to solve this problem where you have, where you, you are not trusting the network, but you still need to know what the time is. So you have public servers operated by, for example, Google and Cloudflare that you can use for this. Uh, simple uh, introduction to rough time is that you generate a number, doesn't have to mean anything for you. You give it to a rough time server and you receive back a signed timestamp radius, which we will talk about in a bit, and a, well, the signature. So you can ver va validate that this was actually from this, uh, this server. This is not encrypted, so anyone that is, you know, listening on this can also audit this. So it it is possible to detect, for example, state level attacks where if if a rough time server were to be compromised and only lie to certain IPs, that would be easily de detectable for anyone that wishes. So what what is? Oh yeah, thanks to Cloudflare for for these um, uh, diagrams. So what is this radius? Well, the problem is that we're doing signatures and, and checking on, uh, on potentially a lot of uh, incoming requests. So what rough time does is that it has this concept of a batch where uh, the server can, in order to save CPU cycles or otherwise, uh, batch everything together. So they say, okay, well, I'm gonna wait for an extreme example would be five seconds and then take all the requests and then sign everything in, in a one go. And there is a way for that to be done very efficiently in the protocol. Uh, and in that case, the radius would be five seconds because you have an uncertainty of five seconds in, uh, in that uh, reply. So the problem here is, okay, well, we now have an uh, unauthenticated 
or oh, sorry, we have an authenticated uh, time window, which, but that is not good enough for locks. But we can use it together with MTP to uh, get a precision uh, or a, pre a precision a precision timestamp. Sorry, uh, this allows us to both have the pi needed. Uh, in that we have a time window where we can trust that the time is in, and we have the precision for logs. So the worst case scenario is that someone lies on the NTP, but that can just uh, skew the time a bit, right? So your logs will maybe not be as precise, but I don't know, why would anyone, like as an attacker, why would you do that? There is nothing for you to gain. And more in Sevda code, not so much Sevda code, maybe there. It is part of a open source project where uh, called UBMC, where you this is more or less lifted from the uh, UBMC. Uh, anyone familiar with Go knows that there uh, are a couple of if error equals or not equals nil missing, but that's that's about it. So this is this is how simple it can be in order to get an authenticated time. The yeah sorry yeah. Yeah, could you, yeah, repeat yeah, it in, from... in the model where the BMC is hardware root trust and yep. it, it authenticates BIOS. Yeah. And if we expose an API to set time only in the BIOS, yeah. why do you think it's a challenge? Why uh, why do you trust the BIOS here? Right? If if I'm on a bare metal uh, if I bought a server and I set the hardware clock to 1970, wouldn't the BMC trust that time in that case? But but how how you can tamper with BIOS because that's you're trusting BIOS right? You're authenticating BIOS that that was a yeah, BIOS that you programmed during factory. Time time is stored in the hardware clock of the 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 machine, right? So if I can just set the hardware clock, which is a normal thing for the the operating system to do. So unless you have like two RTCs on the board where one is authenticated in some way and one is unauthenticated which is the one you can like, because as, as a customer, I would maybe want to be able to set my uh, time. For example, a, a common uh, thing that you have to choose is if you want the hardware clock to be UTC or local time. And if I'm installing an operating system on the bare metal that requires UTC or local time, and this this BIOS clock is something else, I'm, I, I'm happy to talk about it afterwards, uh, about this. Uh, I, yeah, cool, thanks. Um, so the trade-off that we're doing here is, of course, we're adding trust to some other service, and we need a way to validate that. And in the case of rough time, we add some public keys uh, for, for these servers. This is not very different from the, the, uh, the trust store that BMCs already have in, 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 order to be, uh, sorry, in order to be able to validate HTTPS certificates. So it shouldn't be a big deal, but it's worth mentioning. So what, what we have gained here is that we have decoupled the, the the trust of the host's time system and but we added a dependency on an independent third party for some pro, uh, for some companies this might be a problem but there is really not, not a, such a big deal to run your own in uh, in-house rough time and compile your firmware or set your bmc to use your in-house rough time server instead okay so we managed to look at that uh, and then I want to, so we, we have two more pie in the sky things to look at. So provisioning. So this is, uh, yeah, I, yeah, there is a slight typo here where we, uh, this is, but this is normally how you would, uh, you buy a box, you set up your own network, preferably not using the same IP that you're about to SSH into, but uh, that's, your mileage may vary, I guess. So you set up your uh, local IP address, and then you SSH to the machine you set up. You configure an IP, you change the password, you set a host name. Yeah, that's uh, usually how, how you have to provision these. Incidentally, it's also interesting that California passed, uh, uh, I think it was a law uh, f one year ago or something, that f forbids connected devices to have a default password. So how you SSH into the machine initially is also an interesting food for thought. But maybe if you're a bit more, uh, a bigger corp, you have a process in order to uh, register a MAC address for your global DHCP server that you then 
connect your server into that you can now straight SSH into the DNS name. Oh, that's that's a that's a better way. Uh, you still have to set password. If you're lucky, you uh, the BMC accepted that host name, but DHCP is an un uh, untrusted, unverified source. So that means that someone, some a some actor on your network can change your host name, which probably isn't a great thing. Another big thing or a big problem with this approach is when the there, yeah. It's, uh, uh, hmm. Can anyone think of a problem with relying on DHCP like this? So, when when you have like either Raptors or a power outage in your data center, and all your servers go down and then suddenly come back up, you have you know, 10,000 servers that suddenly want the DHCP if the DHCP server is even alive because everything went down. So preferably, what we need is instead of using DHCP, we, we need a magical protocol that supports automatic, or sorry, at automatic predictable addressing without collision that is stateless, or at least not fan in, and that is already supported Preferably, it should also end with the number six. Uh, but yeah, it turns out that IPv6 is everything we need here because the router, instead of us asking for a, an IP address, the router is just constantly broadcasting. This is how, an, um, this is how a network addresses looks like in this network. So you, the only thing you need to do is listen. If you don't have a router, maybe that went down in that power outage as well you have the FE80 or the link local addresses. So relying on that is not a big deal. You can also use uh, uh, this broadcast add-on called RDNSS in order to uh, add name servers. So you have a more or less perfect replacement for DHCP here. And it's all uh, stateless, almost. Because what the, the one thing we're missing here is a host name, right? So, and this is this is trickier because host names are it's kind of like Tolkien versus uh, Smurfs, right? So one one company wants to name it X, some other one wants to name it A1, right? So this is I don't think we will ever fix this or change this. So we need to accept that this is uh, customer dependent and needs to come externally. But one way we can improve on this is we use something that is not uh, so DHCP is a kind of an annoying protocol in that you have to like, the DHCP server has to do a lot of things. It needs to maintain this least database and uh, and calculate a bunch of things. So that is part of why it's so hard to scale that. DNS servers are really easy to scale in that you just have a static file mostly and that you serve from a lot of the uh, these um, uh, DNS servers. So if we use DNS instead, which is a, a part of DNS called pointers, uh, reverse lookups. So instead of doing a host name to IP, you do an IP to host name. And this used uh, in a lot of cases in the, on the internet already. So essentially what we are looking at is that you do an IPv6 RA, so you listen into that when you boot up. And when you then have your uh, IPv6 address, you do a, a, a reverse lookup on that and say, hey, what host name is this? Oh, sorry. Uh, and that's how you get your host name. So instead of doing a stateful handshake using a, a DHCP, we now re replace it by only doing stateless stuff. So in summary, what have we gained here? Well, we removed the need for having a DHCP server. You got a dependency on a DNS server. Most likely you already have that. You might not have configured it always. It might have been a best case thing, but yeah, now you actually need it, uh, which is might be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on how you look at it. And there are data centers out there, and quite big ones as well, that do not support IPv4 at all. Right. So now we have removed that problem. We replaced it with IPv6. OK, let's do authentication. It's, it's a big, a broad topic. And oh, I only have 10 minutes left. Crap. Oh, well. So let's only look at the server authentication. 
So how does that look today? Well, I, I found a picture that perfectly illustrates how server authentication is, is done today for embedded devices. And it looks like this, where you don't really have any trust at all on the device, right? So the first initial request that you do for any device that I know of does not contain a certificate that you have any idea to, to validate. So what some do is that they accept this warning, log in, and then replace the cert. And a lot of manuals say that you have to be using a trusted network. So you have to take the machine and connect it straight to your laptop, set everything up, and then replace the, the cert and all that stuff. That's pretty annoying. So, and not only that, actually. So the problem here is that we don't trust the BMC, but also nothing else trusts the BMC. So the, the BMC, in this case, cannot use its certificate in order to call any other kind of services. So what you can do is you can type danger. They, they change that in Chrome, and we'll get back to that later. Uh, and then you get past this, or you can press all the buttons, and, and you just say, yes, 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 I accept all this risk. The problem is that people started printing this into manuals that you know you go to this IP address of your thing and then you type danger on your keyboard and then you log in. Right? So they decided to change this and I think they rotate this uh, uh, every every other year or so now. Uh, it used to be bad idea and then or yeah something like that this is insecure or something like that. So there must be a better way. Uh, this is not a problem on the internet. Why is it a problem on the BMCs? Well, I, I'm here to tell you there is a better way. So the, let's see. In the past, so what, 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 okay, so let's look at it this way. What do we need? Well, it, the reason we see this is because the, the browser does not trust whoever created the certificate. In this case, it is ourselves. So there is a loop we have to, to break there. So in the, what you usually do is you go to a certificate, of, uh, sorry, a, a certificate authority and buy a, a cert. This is how you've done it in the past, and it costs maybe 100 bucks or so. We don't want everyone to have to buy a cert uh, in order to log into their BMCs, of course. That's, that's why it's so great that there is this service called Let's Encrypt. Uh, Let's Encrypt offers anyone uh, trusted certificates. And they, they have an API to easily get this. Uh, they, they are a provider, or they are an, in, an implementer, I should say, of the ACME protocol. So if you don't want to use their CA, you can implement the ACME protocol, and they have plenty of service to do that inside your own company. So if you have like a, a, yeah, a corp CA that everyone trusts, you can use that for this instead. But for everyone else, we can use Let's encrypt. But what do we need to do in order to use that? I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't see the same slides as I'm seeing here. Oh, there we go. So uh, his, the, the first challenge that Let's Encrypt requires you to, uh, to respond to in order to prove that uh, you should get a certificate is that you run a web server on a, a certain domain. That means putting our BNC on the internet, which probably is not a great idea. So let's let not consider that at, uh, at this time. The other thing they support is a DNS name we control. Well, lucky that we actually already sold this, that we now have a IPv6 address that always maps to our DNS name. So by doing this and trusting this, we can just add a single DNS delegation and say that the BMC is actually authoritative for that uh, name. And there are plenty of ways to do this securely in uh, modern uh, DNS servers. So that's not, a, that's not a problem. So essentially, what we're looking at is the first initial boot would be that uh, the BMC does an ACME request to some provider. It has, like, maybe it lets encrypt uh, for, as, as, as a default. This provider does a DNS probe to validate that the, the BMC is still, or is the one it claims to be. And then you, in the ACME response, you get a perfectly valid TLS certificate. This has a, tr uh, the, the trust model here is that your network is secure, but that is already the case 
today. So that is not a, a, uh, a uh, or, sorry, that is not a regression. And there are ways to solve this without trusting the networks as well, but this is the easiest way. So what have we done here? Well, we have replaced that manual and maybe not so uh, used certificate management process. Maybe the big actors actually use to replace the self-signed certificate, but I have not seen a server uh, that is not running UBMC that has a proper certificate. And we added a trusted machine identity, not only for us to trust that, but also now that machine is able to claim that it really is that machine to talk to any other service you, you might have in your network. So if, if you, for example, want to do SSL terminated um, syslogging, you can do that now. So instead of anyone being able to say, yes, I'm totally that mail server, you can now uh, trust that from the BMC that this is actually the BMC that is logging. So in summary, uh, we have a summary of the summary where our trusted time source enables us to do uh, modern things like certificate authentication. By applying IPv6 and DNS machine provisioning, we, we are now com uh, compatible with the conventional web trust model where we can use all the technologies and uh, security benefits that that provides or that has been invented for the public web. Uh, I think that not secure, having that symbol is, is not cool and we can do, do better. So in UBMC, which is a greenfield BMC uh, built in Go using the same code base as Linux boot, this has been implemented. We focus on being very opinionated, as, as you probably uh, saw, it, but that provides us with a very slim code base and offers us to really uh, do crazy things and see how that uh, turns out and, and if we can uh, move that forward. So if you enjoyed this or you want to keep in touch, this is how you uh, keep up to date with uh, what I'm doing. And this is where you go to check out the code for UBMC. And uh, with this, uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'll let it to Benjamin to, to bring the mic around. There was one here as well. Thanks for the talk, Chris. Um, Thanks. I've played with UBMC a bit. That's pretty cool. Uh, I'd like to get some of your ideas into OpenBMC. Yeah. Do you have any plans? Uh, yeah, we, we, I've been um, chatting. I, I forgot with whom I chatted with, but uh, we have a plan to write up this ACME uh, proposal for OpenBMC. For example, how, on how in OpenBMC I would see that as an optional way of setting up your provisioning, maybe doing some DHCP options to point out an ACME server. This is where you get your initial uh, certificate. I think there is a lot of things we can play with there, and uh, it would be really cool to do. Uh, there, that's like OpenBMC is. Like a good thing with OpenBMC is that it listens to a lot of people, and there is a this whole process around contributing. But so there is more. It, it requires more time from my part in order to you know produce all the the design documents and all that stuff. So I'm here to spark interest in in the ideas. But yes, that is, for example, Acme is, is certainly something I, I would like to to uh, to see how we can use in OpenBMC. IPv6 is also something I've been from the sides pushing more on that uh, uh, in when I started looking at OpenBNC, uh, I, I think it was just getting IPv6 official support. But I, I really hope that we can make sure that everything is just working IPv6 only as well. So that, that is something that, that I'm quite excited about. But thanks. Uh, my question is uh, how the BMC, when the BMC is making a request to the ACME server, yep. how is it secure? So the so you what you do when okay, it is using HTTPS, and the HTTPS certificate store is usually shipped with a system. So uh, does that answer your question, or do you want more details? Or uh, when we see like the BMC is always like shipping up with like a self signed certificates. So when the very yeah. first time when we ship the system, it's the self-signed certificates. So so in UBMC, we don't have self-signed uh, certificates. It does. 
it, it, it does not. Like the the, fir the first, the only certificate that is uh, used is this Let's Encrypt uh, provider one. So it never has a self sign. What I thought of like uh, Let's Encrypt certificate, like yeah. you send an ACME request and then you get a certificate. Yes, exactly. But the, so but in that to, in case, like very very yeah, first. Sorry. Very first time, how do you get a certificate? The, but that is that is how you do it. Uh, let's encrypt. Ha so when you think about it, when you go to like a normal web page using your browser, you don't need a certificate in order for that to be encrypted, right? The server has the uh, certificate, so you don't need anything. And likewise, when UBMC does the initial request, it does not need anything. the the w The way it authenticates to the server is by doing this DNS challenge. That we saw the, the 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 pointer dance. Does that mean like the client has to accept the accept the server certificate whatsoever it is? No, uh, uh, you can do that. That's a horrible way of doing it, but you can do it. But what usually what you do is uh, you ship this trust store of it. It has things like uh, the name uh, escapes me, but it has like very sign super duper uh, root CA that that then has another CA that has another CA and then. That's uh, Let's Encrypt, right? So this is like a store. It's I think it's like Mozilla CA store or something like that that contains hundreds of certificates that are globally trusted. Uh, this is how the, the HTTPS web of trust works. So you ship that with the BMC as well, and that allows it to do conventional HTTPS. Oh, so you're saying like all the third party signed certificates, uh, the known known root CA certificates would be there on the on the yeah. Okay. If if you don't trust that for your company, maybe you want to run your own ACME server, things like that. Then of course compiling and whatever search you want. Yeah. Uh, that's it. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> I think, uh, so uh, I believe NTP has, a, I mean, like normally by default, if the drift is too large, it'll panic. Yeah. But there is a configuration where you can tinker it and say, don't panic on this one, so it'll accept right. the drift. So the, the problem with that is when UBMC starts, it does not require a RTC. Like in some cases, the BMCs do not have an RTC at all. So every time you boot, it's 1970. That's a very uh, large drift that you need to accept there. So the, you can't sanity check, right? Like you have to accept whatever NTP re reply you get. The alternative there is that you have an RTC for the BMC, but then still, then you have to kind of trust the the clock that came from factory, and then you just move the the thing elsewhere. I've been messing a bit with so. On these BMC, uh, for example, on the A speed, the initial power on from cold boot is 1970. But I used the A speed uh, built in RTC to keep the the time across uh, re uh, reboots at least. So you don't have to like you have slightly slightly or slightly faster uh, boot time the second time because you don't you can do the you still do the uh, the time dance, but you don't block boot on this. So in UBMC example, for example, everything is blocked on that. First, you get the DNS name, and then you get the time, and then you get the the certificate. This takes like ten seconds the first boot, but then the, uh, the second boot we still do that, but we do it in the background because we can operate on the uh, on the previous results. If that makes sense. Well, did I answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. yeah thanks. Thanks. Okay. Thank you for your talking. Uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, you need to set up an in-house uh, rough time server, right? Yep. Uh, it is trusted. Uh, Sorry. Then my question yeah. is, why not set up a trusted NTP server in-house? You, uh, you could do that. The NTP has a scalability issue. I, I didn't read into wait uh, too much because not having it publicly deployed was a blocker for me. But yes, you can certainly do a secure NTP. The problem with that is, of course, then you have one one way of doing it for the businesses, and then one way of doing it for everyone that just wants like a uh, like. Imagine that you're a business that wants to deploy a server out uh, at a customer. Maybe you're sell, selling an appliance. Then maybe you can't use your secure NTP thing because then you need to re reach it over the internet, and maybe that's yeah, maybe it works. I don't know, but. Yeah, it's it's essentially to to narrow down and create one solution that works for everyone. Okay. In regards to the NTP setup, do you have something to recheck rough time periodically to make sure you're not susceptible yeah. to skew attacks? And yeah. then the other question was, uh, 
in the case of having many BMCs on a single, single layer two, do you have a solution for making sure they can trust each other if they want to talk to each other? or they can't impersonate each other? Because right now with the ACME protocol, you couldn't actually guarantee that. Right, so the ACME protocol doesn't, I mean, the ACME protocol relies on that the DNS works, right? Which I think is what you're getting at. Well, no, I'm also getting at like, you could knack duplicate address detection request from another BMC and take their address and then run ACME on yourself and impersonate that BMC. Yes, you trust, uh, you trust. So is the there network, like yeah. some trust on first use model where you can have keys that are kind yeah. of persistent over the lifetime of the BMC so, so was, that you know that that BMC is the same BMC and not a new one that showed up and took the yeah. address? You, you can do that. The, I'm just wondering if you have anything that you're like planning in that area. So I, I've been thinking about this, but it mostly boils down to that it's a lot of work and there is a lot of things to to fix before that. And a lot of people's uh, threat model does not include the local network. So while we could certainly fix it, it feels more like a uh, academic approach to security than uh, something that uh, someone would actually want to use. But if there is like a big uh, user that wants or someone that really wants to do this and would be happy to experiment, I'm happy to take any pull requests or I don't know, just fork UBMC and do whatever you want with it. Like that's, I'm really interested to see what people think about this. I have some ideas, but it's, it is quite like, Networks in general, like there are, there is, for example, 8021X, right, where you use a certificate in order to authenticate, and there is like um, things you can do there. You could also, yeah, yeah, as long as your switch has supported that. If exactly, you were trying yeah, to talk it, from BMC to BMC, if you went out, you could just do it on the router. But yeah, sure. I, yeah, but I'm I'm happy to, if I have any ideas, I'm happy to, uh, to okay. talk to you about it. So how do you realize this concept on an aggregated resource model where you have a rack and you have 48 plates in the rack and then you have a rack manager yep. uh, or sort of a manager for the rack and then you have a consolidated kind of manager for the racks. And right. then, so basically where like a data center is sort of aggregated with respect to resources, right? Yeah. So running a, a trusted time server might not scale, right? So when, when right. we already have a rack manager that is trusted, I mean, why do you think that a all blades requesting DSCP at the same time might be an issue? And at the same time, why can't the blades trust the, the rack managers? Or I the mean, you can certainly create this uh, these elaborate chains if you want to. Rough time doesn't require that. Right? It, it, it is made to scale to run publicly on the internet. And I'm pretty sure your data center is not going to be as big as the public internet. So, like, I mean, you, you, you can certainly... If you dimension it so that every server reboots at the same time and requires a, a rough time check at that time, rough time got you covered there. Like that's that's why it was created to be able to scale to these things. Then your question, your other part of that question was the the chain of trust. And sure, like if you want to to have that chain of trust, if it makes sense for you, for your deployment, then go ahead. It's a lot of people don't have a rack management unit. A lot of companies run only a single machine or a handful of machines and run some VMware ESXi cluster over that, and that's the whole data center. So you shouldn't forget the small guys as well. But thanks for the question. And you suggested that... Uh... Sorry, I don't think the mic is just for the recording. Uh, so you suggested that uh, we don't need a DSCP for IPv6. So how yep. do we get the first address? Like, do we assign it statically? No. So in uh, IPv6, the router always advertises the RAs. Yeah, the RAs exactly. So the RAs use uh, what's called SLAAAC, right? So we only use that. Like, you can use DHCP as well in order to get if you if if an enterprise or someone wants a more uh, Machine determined IP, you can use that. But in order to support everyone's use case where you don't have any other external uh, infrastructure, you could use uh, RAs. Yeah, but at the same time, considering as you said, the power down and hundred servers are yeah. Uh, but the, for the RA, the RA is not fan in. It's one broadcast to everyone, right? Then you have the neighborhood discovery. So if you have like a enormous L two domain, then you have some problems there. But that that is not. That it that doesn't change the power on story because those neighborhood discoveries are sent periodically anyway. So that's that's already the status quo. 
So if you, but if the RA solution just, yeah, just works like DHCP, the way you normally configure this, I guess, is you would have the like a DHCP relay set up. So all the different L2s that you have in your network would fan into the same DHCP server anyway. And usually that would receive very little traffic. Mm -hmm. So that's why you have this meltdown scenario. Uh, but in the RA case, if you segregate it, then, then all your routers for you, or even if it's a single router, that RA would go out on, the, on every single uh, L2, but the neighborhood discovery protocol would only run into that domain, right? So there would be no catastrophic meltdown as such. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. Like you're not gonna ask for every neighbor. That's not a thing that you. Oh, okay. I I might so be. You're just gonna ask for what you care about, what you're trying to talk to, which is probably the round. Right. Yeah. But I'm, I'm thinking if someone does say like an FFOs to colon colon one thing, you know, it's like, well, hey, give me. Actually, in IPv6, they actually uh, broadcast that to a multicast group. Right. So it only goes to the address based on like the suffix. Right. And so it actually won't hit every node. Oh. The okay. switches will yeah, actually but, filter it out. But in this case, th those multicast groups would be everyone in that L2, right? No, it's actually, it's based on like the suffix of the address. So if there's sufficient randomness, it'll only hit a small subset of nodes. Oh, okay. I did not know that, but yeah, that's even better. Like it's. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. scalable. It's pretty good. Yep. I hope you still have a thundering word problem if everyone comes up and asks for their uh, host name. Could you repeat it for the recording? Yeah. Sorry. Don't, don't you still have a thundering horde problem if every node boots and then asks for its host name from the DNS? Yeah. The, the, the pro yes, but the problem with this is, or my, my assertion or uh, whatever the word is, is that DNS scales much better than DHCP. That DNS is just reading it from a static file that you have all these DNS records and that you can easily scale that statelessly. While well, but, but you wouldn't have a DNS record for a machine you had never heard of. Uh, you would. Right? And the, so the idea, the, the whole idea here is that you, you take the MAC address uh, that you still need to do some uh, from like you need to assign your machine identity, your serial number, MAC address, whatever, with a host name that makes sense for your company. You're doing that in your DHCP today. You would do this here as well. So you would, in that process, you would assign that DNS record, right? So when you get like the uh, the bill from uh, Lenovo or wh whoever you bought your server from, uh, and you ask, okay, give me the MAC addresses of these servers so I can register them in our inventory system. You have I them. I don't know anyone who pre-registered MAC addresses. I, we we do it unless, like on, on unless you're in a huge yeah. data center. Uh, I'm, uh, yeah. So how would you associate the name of the machine in that case? Like, well, it, most, it, mostly I don't bother with names for BMCs. Right, but for the actual host. Like how how do you set like yeah. static IP everywhere? Yeah, well, how do you discover no. it for the first time? You, you you usually you set a host name after you install it, right? And then the host registers with DHCP that host name, right? So, so you're setting the host name locally on the box on the host, yeah, oh. right? So which yeah, which again you don't you want to bother with a BMC because who, who I wants? mean you can uh, I you, you can certainly do that uh, I think it's quite common in in like Windows Active Directory setups that you do that they have like this dynamic DNS setup I'm not familiar with to me that sounds kind of scary that every every machine potentially has a a way to manipulate the DNS and claim to be anyone so my in this scheme, but you're, 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 you're correct in that it requires a pre-processing step where you register the MAC address with the identity that you want that to have. But that is only, the, the, assuming trust in the local network, that is the only step you have to do in this scenario. Yeah, but thanks for your question. I think we're, yeah. Uh, sorry, a question. So you trust the MAC address very much. So yep. what happens if somebody overwrites the MAC address? After right. BMC? But the, so that that goes back to the that the threat model is that the local network is trusted. Like there there are ways we can change that, and I, uh, it's just, I don't think, today, the processes still require you to trust the network. Like there, we have we've seen so many things about the BMC where you have the self signed certificate, right? You ex you accept that. If you haven't uploaded a, uh, a uh, another certificate there, you still trust the network, right? So there are 
you know, data centers, I'm sure, where they are still running the default uh, self-generated certificate on the BMC. So then in that case, it, it doesn't matter. Like you're already susceptible to man-in-the-middle attacks because you're accepting whatever you're getting back from the BMC. So the MAC address doesn't really matter in that case, uh, is, is my claim. You don't look like you agree, but... Uh, I Sorry, I, I just mean that uh, the network I, I do trust, but I do not trust the machine itself. Right. So, so well, and, and the, the machine, machine is on the network, so, uh, yeah. But you don't have any check right now that you would check the switch is connected to the right machine. Right. But, so, uh, I mean, so, yes. Like, the threat model definitely makes this. Like, we, we this is certainly something we can look into more, but it's, the, there are, it becomes really tricky because then you're entering the dimension of deployment specific things, right? You could add yeah. a Mac filter on the port of the switch that would, uh, that would change or that would lock that down. But again, then it requires whatever switch infrastructure you have in your data center. You could, I don't know, uh, pre like all this would be, so in, in the ACME protocol, for example, you don't have to use DNS. One, one way we could see in the future is that we figure out the perfect way to do this, and we could add another uh, way to uh, assert your identity, right? So maybe we every BMC contains a, a public-private key that you can now get, and that could be, like, we could add a, a new ACME challenge that says, yes, you're, you're allowed to assert that because you have the secret for that. Like, we could certainly do that, but today, my claim is that the network, like, if... You have a bad actor on your local network. The way things are set up in a common data center, you're screwed anyway. So. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Any more questions? Or I think we're out of time. So. Yep. Um, so uh, thanks for the talk. Thanks.